Hi, Carol. Hi, Rick. Rick, it's Carol. I had such a hard time at the book club. I never ever know what's wrong, but I could never, I kept getting kicked out every other minute. I know, what device were you on? I have to take a call, I'll be right back. Um, in Phillips, Texas, um, and he, he um, um, was uh, uh, a churchgoer there. There weren't a lot of things for kids to do, but uh, he did go to church, and um, it turns out that that uh, he was uh, somewhat of an evangelist. Uh, the uh, um, the county jail needed someone to come on Sundays to talk to the to the prisoners and so um, Max volunteered for for that job and would give him a, a talk a little sermon on on um, uh, Sundays and one Sunday in particular he was um, getting his stuff together and looked down the hall and there was this young lady uh, working on a box and so he went down to to see what she was doing and if she needed some help. And she was actually putting together a, a portable organ. And um, so uh, her job was to, to play the organ and accompany a quartet that was gonna be singing that, that day. <laughs> and so he, he, it, she caught his eye and uh, um, they, they later on became uh, better friends and um, um, they uh, met more than, more than once at the, uh, uh, at the jail. And um, for, for a, um, a time, he uh, thought that there might be something more to be gained from, from this relationship. And, and so, um, he, he went ahead and, and went about his normal routine on, on Sundays. And then over time, um, he decided that he wanted to kind of pursue this and uh, did talk to her. And he was thinking about going to college and was planning on going to Baylor. And uh, so he talked to, talked to her about uh, maybe she would like to go to Baylor too. And so turns out uh, uh, that he did talk her into it and they were both there at the same time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> after, after a graduation from Baylor Med. Uh, no, not med. Hmm? Baylor Medical School? Uh, I, I said Baylor Med. <laughs> Baylor University. Uh, he, 
uh, he decided to go to law, law school and went to UT Law School. Um, and after, after graduating from law school, um, um, Max uh, went to uh, Amarillo and started working for a law firm uh, there in Amarillo. Um, and he, he uh, uh, was, was doing well in, in the law the law practice, and then um, he began to get some interest in, in politics. And so um, after, after a while, he decided to, to run for a public office and he was going to run for um, a Senate seat. And it uh, turns out that uh, um, he did well and actually won, won the election. And um, um, became a state state senator. Uh, his, the problem with the law firm was that they said, you can't run for politics. And so that sort of put him at odds with them. But um, he, he was uh, successful as a, a state senator and uh, um, was was became good friends of Barbara Jordan and uh, became well known in in uh, state politics. Uh, uh, after, after, after a while, um, he uh, was in contact with the, the um, um, with the uh, office of the uh, uh, West Texas a and M University, which is in Canyon, and so they they offered him a uh, the presidency of that uh, uh, that new university, and so he he accepted that job, and uh, he was started there in 1977, and and uh, finished in 1982. Okay, let him tell the rest of the story. Uh, hmm? Let Max tell the rest of the story. <clears throat> if, um, Max, if you'd like to jump in and correct me for any, <laughs> any of these errors, uh, feel Drew, free. Drew, Just... I love you very much, and you were a good tennis player, but you sure play loose with the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm just going. I'm just going to leave some of those hanging fragments out there, and and uh, people may <laughs> have to read the book to kind of put it all together because. Uh, uh, but, but you're kind of weaving a nice tale that uh, I'm just going to have to. I'm just going to have to leave them as hanging threads. Okay. Good. Tell him. Hmm? Go, go. go ahead, Max. <clears throat> you want me to go talk on the book now? Yeah. Sure. Okay, I will just kind of maybe share some, but first I need to express a great deal of gratitude to Drew. We did meet on the tennis court, and I believe I'm correct that uh, when Barbara Jordan almost drowned, uh, Drew was her doctor, and I was in Amarillo. This is not in my notes, so, but uh, my, I got a call that she might not live uh, very long, so I got on a plane and flew back, and since five summers while I was in school, I sold books and Bibles door to door. So I knew how to get into a place that you weren't supposed to get into. So about midnight, I got the janitor at the hospital to let me in and convinced him I was legitimate. And I went down to the basement. And as I recall, Barbara Jordan was on a gurney and Drew was there and, uh, and she made it through and then of course lived for several more years. But so we go back a long way, but uh, I really am grateful for the chance to talk about the book a little bit because it's a book about love, dementia, and Alzheimer's. And I am now 86 years old. Uh, and the love affair portion of the book was written over a long lifetime. Uh, most of the dementia and the Alzheimer's portion of it is really a product of the last eight years. So you would say from very late 70s until now. 
So I hope as I share these remarks that if you have a question and I, I'm, I, I may not be able to see a question. So if Rick or someone would wave a hand, I'll stop. But I, I've got a few general remarks and, and uh, I'm really hoping that the book is helpful to people and I'll share one or two examples. But most families in one way or another either have been or will be touched by this dreadful disease. And I'm so grateful for Capital City Village and its goal of keeping people in their homes as long as possible. So the book, Releasing the Butterfly, A Love Affair in Four Acts is uh, really a story of how Jean Allison and I achieved that goal uh, long before Capital City Village was ever established about 2011. But we, about that same year, we were leaving our home that we had built in 1983 to move into a retirement community here at Westminster. And it was kind of almost dovetailed with the creation of, of Capital City Village. It was never my intention to write a memoir. As the book started, it was therapy for me as the patient. And I was also my own therapist. And night after night into the wee hours of the morning, I would uh, talk to myself uh, about the trauma of separation and Alzheimer's. And, uh, it, and then it kind of started out because I wasn't able to talk about uh, the real people, Gene, Alice, and Max. I, I created a fictional play going back to the old high school play, Our Town by Thornton Wilder. And so I was George and my wife was Emily. We were both fictional. It was fiction. It was not real because I couldn't talk about it as real. <coughs> and so that midnight therapy sessions, the way that kind of ended up morphing into a book is that I recorded scene by scene as I had my therapy session each night, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. And the three act play morphed into a five act play almost five years ago. And then about two years ago, maybe a little longer, it morphed into uh, the butterfly broke out of the chrysalis and morphed again. And this time it was a fictional novel told by a fictional woman, Emily. It was all in a woman's voice. And I called it at that time, one hell of a woman because it was really a tribute to Jean Alice uh, and her life and all that she had done. And uh, so she was telling the story and I thought it might be helpful to let you have an idea of how it evolved because this is not the way it's in the, in the book that's out now, but this is the way it was when she was telling it. So chapter one started with Emily and I'll have to read a little of this, but my 14 year old and think this is Emily talking, this is the woman. My 14 year Alzheimer's journey began with a simple concern. It survived a tsunami. It now continues along an uncharted vast wilderness. I have a canoe and two sets of oars. George, my lover, rose with me. I was concerned about forgetting and not remembering to getting lost while taking my granddaughters to school, to giving up my own car. Our canoe was a senior living apartment in a life care community, just in case dementia migrated into Alzheimer's. And then the tsunami hit one night when George looked into my face and saw a ferocious lion. We now live apart. I am in 1115 in the memory unit on the first floor. George is in our independent living apartment, 3007 on the third floor, but we still row together. We fell in love in the shadow of the Armstrong Browning Library on the campus of Baylor University. Elizabeth Barrett Browning laid the foundation for our life together in Sonnet 43 when she asked, how do I love thee? And then she answered by telling us to be sure and count the ways that we love. And count we did for over 60 years. So many ways, so much love. 
But sadly, Miss Browning did not prepare us to know how to love as we trod through the slushy world of Alzheimer's. And please remember, this is Jean Alice, or this is fictional Emily talking. In the bleak house of Alzheimer's, love is fragile and often on the brink of losing its power. If one is not careful, everything can become medical, pharmaceutical, clinical, legal, agonizing, suffocating, both to the beloved with Alzheimer's and to the lover caregiver. And then she asked, how do I explain Alzheimer's? And this is she talking. To me, it is like Carl Sandburg's poem, Fog. The fog comes on little cat feet. It sits looking over harbor and city on silent haunches, and then it moves on. Dementia creeps in on little cat feet as it sits on its silent haunches, waiting to pounce on you, first with early stage Alzheimer's, before it overwhelms you with a tidal wave after tidal wave of a catastrophic tsunami. It does not move on. I can no longer see the Golden Gate Bridge. The first tidal wave is at three o'clock in the morning. I wake up and silently slip out of bed. George is snoring. I sneak out of the apartment to go somewhere I desperately need to be. Nighttime building security notices me at the secured entrance and exit to our complex. I am confused and disoriented. I do not know where I am or why I'm there. I cannot answer his general questions. He takes me by the hand and leads me back to 3007. I'm so happy to see George. I gave him a big hug, take his hand insisting, let's go to bed. We snuggle up and drift off to sleep. So now I'm speaking as a guy, not in the book. So I'm very frustrated at this point. And so an editor friend of mine agrees to read the first 25 pages. And he tells me how difficult it is to tell a story in just one voice. And he says and advises me, <coughs> he says, you need an editor. <clears throat> he recommended Marianne Roser, who used to write for the Austin American Statesman, who said that she, when I met with her, the only time she said she thought it would probably have to be a memoir to fill in so many blanks. So she helped me take a 12,000 piece jigsaw puzzle and put it into releasing the butterfly. It took us about eight months, but it all came to fruition and was self-published on Amazon just November of this last year. In one of the meetings with Mary Ann, in fact, the only meeting where we've met in person, it's all been via text and on the telephone. <coughs> she warned me that as we worked through the process, she was, and these are her words, they were, she was probably going to kill several of my darlings which meant she was going to recommend that I leave out many of my stories because they might be important to me, but they might not help tell the story. So I thought I might share with you one that got killed. It didn't make it to the book, but uh, I call it Zelda and Emily. Somewhere deep within the two females in my life are terrified. I am deeply in love with both of them. Zelda is petite. Most of the time, her warm body snuggles up against my left leg, where she will shift from side to side to get closer and then flick her long, silky, soft black hair onto my chest. Often, I fall asleep only to be awakened by her slow, deep, arm sounding breath. As I turn to pull her closer, I caress the nap of her neck and then her shoulder and then her back, I can feel her eyes. Her, my heart melts as I turn to stare into two languid black pearls looking deep into mine without one blink. Zelda is my roommate for the past 11 months. She is a seven year old Shih Tzu, the mother of 22 puppies, a 10 pound 
lion-faced Tibetan Buddhist. Emily is tall and statuesque. Most of the time, she stretches her long, beautiful body diagonally across the eggshell yellow cover of her bed. She will motion for me to come lie beside her in that sly, mischievous way she has of just patting the spot next to her. <coughs> I slide up close and cautiously take her hand, snuggling as close as possible to her warm body. As she relaxes, she turns to put her head in the curve of my head and shoulder. We don't talk. We just breathe slowly, feel our two bodies blending into one. We doze. At the time this was written, Emily is my wife of 55 years, the girl and the woman with whom I have been in love for 65 years. She lives alone in her apartment and I live alone in mine. The two females in my life are also goddesses. Zelda is my bodhisattva. Each morning she comes to sit in my lap and look deeply into my eyes. There are no words, it is, there's no movement, but it's spiritual. Emily is beautiful. She smiles, she winks at me, she wiggles her nose to tease me. She reaches out to hold my hand. She gives me two kisses on the lips. We look into each other's eyes and I say, I love you. She looks deeply into mine and says, I love you too. That, that too is spiritual. The two females of my life are possessed by demons. Zelda by lightning and thunderstorms. Emily by Alzheimer's. I cannot quiet the storms, nor can I eradicate or cure Alzheimer's. <coughs> Several years ago, when our son began his recovery from alcoholism, Jean Alice and I each had a copy of Alcoholics Anonymous 24 hours a day. Each morning we would take turns reading the statement of the day and then the meditation of the day. And recently I picked up a copy and started to read the same sessions on my own. The morning I set aside to organize my thoughts for this afternoon about surviving, uh, surviving in the tunnel of Alzheimer's, I read for the day and then noticed that I had Jean Alice's book. The sentence she had marked with a green marker read like this. It said, all your life is a preparation for more good to be accomplished when God knows that you are ready for it. <coughs> Reading that prompted me to look at my horoscope for the same day. It was a quotation from Leo Tolstoy. Tolstoy said that each time of life has its own kind of love. So let me, let me return to those horrific nights when I was the patient and the therapist. So now in the present, I'm going to talk to the therapist and I'm going to say, <coughs> not fictionally, but Jean Alice and I are ready to share our stories as we have found a lot of light and love in the tunnel of Alzheimer's. We're convinced that God would approve. It's our hope and prayer that our journey with Alzheimer's will move, will prove to be helpful to others on that journey. And here, I hadn't intended to do this, but I was looking this morning, just very briefly at the book, and I'm gonna read you just the very end of act two, which is kind of the end of the love affair. And it starts off, and this would be uh, New Year's Eve of 2002. After a full four nights in December of 2002, having entertained hundreds of friends and family members, we slumped on the sofa beside one another, took off our shoes, and tossed and toasted each other with a glass of wine. Then Jean Alice leaned into my shoulder, gave me a kiss on the cheek, and said, the words that shook me like no other. And she said, Max, 
for the first time in my life, I felt overwhelmed. I think I need to see a doctor. In the last line of chapter two, the monster was on the doorstep and I had not even noticed. And so I think that what I hope that the book does is to help people who might be somewhere working through things like this, that it might help them to notice. And I will share one example. There's a university president who had a copy of the book and he wrote me a wonderful longhand note telling me that his mother had been in dementia for a long time and that uh, his father took care of her. His father was an oil field worker out in West Texas. And he really struggled with it. And he had some of the same kind of experiences that I relate in the book. So he said he was going to send his father a copy of the book and he did. And he attached to it. And here I'm going to show one of the benefits because his father is not a writer. His father had never been a writer but he had taken care of his wife for the last years of her life. And he was beginning to have some of those experiences. So here is a non writer person who's worked in the oil fields. And here are two short poems that he wrote, which my university president sent to me. And the first one is called A Visit to the Doctor. I had an appointment, my daughter drove me. I pushed back, but not hard. Is it time that if I leave town, I need a driver? We drove for about 45 minutes and sat in silence until it was time to go in. The lady at the desk at, in the clinic looked into these tired old eyes and did not look at me again. She addressed all questions and communications to my daughter. She pushed out a paper to be signed. I was determined to prove that I was not senile. I grabbed a pen. There were two small buckets of pens. I took from the one on the left. The woman said condescendingly, those are used and perhaps contaminated. The ones on the right have been cleaned and sanitized. Ah, oh, when the doctor came in, he said I had my mask on upside down. Disappointed at how I came across at the clinic, my driver asked permission to come in with me and see the doctor. I was a little put out. She was taking notes and asking questions. Before we left, I knew it was good she was there. The driver's name was either uh, Skippy or Cindy, end of poem one. Number two is a little briefer. It's called senility. And think back over Emily talking at the beginning of One Hell of a Woman when she relates the uh, Alzheimer's to fog and quotes Carl Sandburg's poem. This is what this fellow wrote on his own called senility. I can see it. It looks like fog. I can smell it repugnant. I can taste it bitter. I can feel it cold. I can hear it like a rushing river. I, I sidestepped it today. I will dodge it tomorrow and the next day and the next and the day after that. Maybe the angels will come to carry me away before it covers me. If not, I will struggle and fight to get free. So that's one reaction. There have been many others. And uh, I would just close by this comment from just uh, Friday afternoon, Friday morning, I'm now an essential caregiver. So I'm able to go over and I have several things I can talk about, but to be sure uh, I give you a chance if anyone wants to ask me a question. But uh, last Friday morning, I, until last week, I had to be tested twice a week for COVID. I would get tested twice a week, and now I only have to be tested once a week. I sat with Gina Alice, and I was holding her hand, telling stories, 
she kind of dozed, she laughed, she rolled her wonderful hazel eyes at me, and we were making love. We were writing scene what I now call scene one, which I hope might be scene one of act five. So with that, if any has a question, I have some other things I can talk about, but uh, and if I know how to do this, I'm gonna bring up your screen and I can see if anyone wants to wave a hand. And if you don't, Rick and Drew, I can keep talking, but I don't wanna miss responding if someone wants to ask me something. Okay, I'm gonna tell two more. And I don't have everybody on here, so if someone else, let me let me tell you about, I call it in there a stigma because I think there is a stigma. No one really likes to talk about dementia and Alzheimer's. And uh, Jean Alice and I moved into uh, Westminster about a little, little over, right at nine years now. And for three years, we pretty much used it like a condominium. And uh, we met a lot of new friends. We moved into the new unit. We were all new. And we had dinner with several of them over and over, but nowhere in, their, in that three year period did anyone ever talk about dementia or Alzheimer's. And then after, after it hit and, we, and Jean Alice was, it was known that she was in memory care over and over many of the same people would ask to come and talk to me and ask me how it felt, what was it like? You know, one of the reasons I'm here is my mother had Alzheimer's, my father, <coughs> my brother, someone. But all of a sudden, I was the go-to guy for people to come and talk to. But a, an example that's in the book, but it's worth telling. I have a friend, J Jerry, who was a, in law school with me. He became a very distinguished judge. And we're, we're good friends, but not real close friends. And so after the event that led to our separation when I shattered my left femur. I had to go to the hospital because it really was shattered and I had to have it repaired. So I was in the hospital for almost two weeks and then rehab for several weeks. And uh, so when I was there very early on, I get a call from Jerry, the judge, and he wants to see if he could come and talk to me. And so he comes and we visit and he's asked how I'm doing. And on the second visit, he says, you may wonder why I wanted to reconnect. And I said, you went a little bit puzzled about it. And he said, well, you know, my mother had Alzheimer's for about 10 years and, uh, and my father took care of her and, uh, and, and then she started wandering. She would go out into the streets one time into a rainstorm and he put a lock on the door, a door so that she couldn't get out. And he had a workshop out in the back. And one day he was out working, came in, and she had taken all of her clothes out of the closet and put it in the car and said she had to go home. And they had been married about 63 years. But the, the, the reason, what, what my experience and what she had learned about through some friends was that all of a sudden he needed someone to talk to. And his mother had now been dead about 10 years. And he just needed to have a someone that, and so we met almost every day but he taught me a lesson that was very important to me because he said uh, one time he came to be with them and they were going to go out take mom out to, to, to have dinner one evening and uh, and she's in the front seat with his father and his father's a type a person like I am and probably like most of you are and uh, they're sitting in the car and she says, uh, well, we can't go without daddy. And her husband of 63 years wants to explain, well, you know, your daddy's been dead for 30 years. He's not, he's not living anymore. She said, yeah, we can't go without daddy because an explanation was not helping. And he kept trying to explain and she kept resisting, getting a little more anxious and furious. And finally, my judge friend, the son sitting in the back seat all of a sudden it dawns on him and he says, mom, I just talked to Papa and he doesn't want to go. Solved, problem was solved. A little white lie said it was okay. And she said, okay. And they went out to dinner and ate. So I learned that uh, I could tell a little white lie. And then probably the most important thing I would share 
is that I'm so glad that I was a lawyer and I gave people a lot of advice over the years that they did not follow. And then they got into trouble and then they had to get out of trouble. So I learned how to follow professional advice. And here I would follow those of you that are professionals if your advice and, and the professional advice I got was that Ms. Sherman is now in memory care and she needs to know that that is now her home. And if, if you can do it, we would advise you not to go see her. She has to know that that is now her home. I will tell you, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, but for the next several weeks, I called her every morning at 10 and every evening at six, but I never went to her room and never saw her. And I had all the protests that you can expect. You've got to come get me. I, I can get my stuff together. I shouldn't be down here. I need to be with you. But we played it out as the professionals kept advising. And eventually uh, they called me, the care team did, and they said, we think you ought to go see her for about 10 or 15 minutes and then don't go across to mealtime and don't go close to, to Sunday where she would expect to be with you and then find a reason to leave. And so we started working those short time, but on the phone when she would call me and tell me I had to come and get her, I would use one of those little white lies and I would tell her, I'd say, you know, Jenny, I'm still in, I'm still in care from my broken hip. So I still have to see the doctor. Well, I didn't have to, hadn't seen the doctor in weeks, but I kept telling her that. So I, the little white lie worked. But I, I learned that only after we had gone through that experience. But I think that's one of the great lessons that I learned. And and uh, the other thing that is I would just share, because I know that in the group here, you have probably people of many different religious faiths. But one of the things that sustained us so very much was, was a, a religious faith. Uh, we started as Southern Baptist, and we did meet in a church service in the jail. And she was seven, she was 15 and I was 17, almost 18. And we went to, uh, to Baylor, which was a Christian school. And then later we morphed into being Presbyterians and, and we've been very active Presbyterians. And I was on the board at, Pres at Austin Seminary for 18 years. <coughs> and we already have gravestones in the cemetery. And on it, one of the things that says for both of us is that we're active Presbyterians. But I do think a religious faith, whatever and however it's experienced is very important to help you know. And one of the other most important things, and Drew mentioned it, is when she was playing the old field organ in the church, we really met because of music. And she was a church organist for 20 years. But music is the one thing that continues to stay alive in the mind of an Alzheimer's patient. Uh, she still will direct music. She will still sing songs. She will still, and there's a piece in the book where we were going through some wonderful times. She could even play the old Baptist hymns again and on the piano and, and did that for quite a long time. But music, uh, even, and then she was on the first port of Conspirari and Craig Hella Johnson sent her all of the CDs of that up to that time. And they're always playing in her room when I go now. And she will join in singing with them and she will direct along with Craig. So music is very much alive in there. And the other is the power of love. I just think it's something that it needs to be fully appreciated. And, and maybe what I ought to do and then take questions. I, I was going to do this, ask if I could do it. it. Well, I will do two things. I'm talking too long, but I'm watching. But uh about oh, two and a half years ago, the weekend nurse, Melissa, called me and she said, Mr. Sherman, would you mind to come over on Saturday and Sunday evening and sit out in the courtyard just outside of the dining room of the memory unit and have a little glass of wine with some of the people, on, there are 30 people on that wing. And so I, I told her, absolutely, I would seize any chance. Well, Jean Alice was very much more engaged at that time and so I the very first night I met out there and and then the, they brought Jeannie and she and I sat on a love bench on one side 
and there was a little circle of chairs and there were going to be about 15 to 20 people. And uh, so we're sitting there hugging and a couple of ladies, a lady named Mary Curtis, who was getting close to 100, and Ann Scott, who's now getting close to 100, they sat in the love seat across from us. And so Mary Curtis, great UT person, she led us in the eyes of Texas and we sang the eyes of Texas. We sang the eyes of Texas again and we sang it again and we sang it again and we sang it again. And she just kept taking us through the eyes of Texas several times. And Ann Scott got a little tired of that and she looked me in the eye and she said, uh, is that woman your girlfriend or is she your wife? And I said, well, she's my wife. And she said, where did you meet? And so I knew with people that were in memory unit, I couldn't tell the whole story. So I said, well, we met at jail in the church service. And I said, I, we invited four quartet, four guys in a quartet to come and sing. And they brought a young, beautiful girl to come and play the organ for them. And so I, I looked over and saw that these beautiful ankles and I fell in love with the ankles of that young girl. And uh, I told her, I'm gonna marry her. And that was pretty much it. And Ann Scott, uh, she says, oh, there's gotta be more, you gotta tell more. And so I'd push me. So we did that for several weeks. That was the story. Seeing about 10 verses, the same, same verse of the eyes of Texas 10 times. And I would tell the story again about how we met. <laughs> and Mary Curtis never got time of the eyes of Texas, but I got tired of being the only storyteller. <clears throat> so I decided I would warm up a little bit. And I decided most of them were women, probably like my mother-in-law, who was a daughter of a Baptist preacher and probably pretty conservative. And so I decided I would stretch it a little bit, make up a little story. And I said, well, you know, one day I was riding my horse across the plains and I came upon this village of teepees and a young girl came out of the teepee one day without a stitch of clothes on and uh, she jumped on a white stallion and started riding across the plains. And I said, you know, by gum, I'm going to catch her. Well, I got laughs from all the, all the women in that group and there were about three men and all the rest were women. So then I, the women would say, tell us a teepee story, tell us a teepee story. So I ended up telling the teepee story over and over and I got a little tired of that. And I thought, well, let me stretch it just a little bit. And Miss Scott one time gave me a chance. She said, there has to be more, there has to be more. And I said, well, I wasn't gonna tell you, but one day uh, I saw her go down, down the side of a mountain. And so I climbed up on the top of the hill on the other side and she was taking a bath in the stream. And so I sat up there and watched her take that bath in the stream. Well, my real story had a little bit more into it than that, but I stopped there. Well, I didn't get any laughs, but I got some wonderful smiles from all the women in the group. They were there. So that wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for being in the memory unit. And, and now I'm gonna, I'll shut up on this one because I wanna, I wanna share because uh, after, after the story that I finished with when we went to the, starting in chapter in Act Three, when we went to uh, uh, Gene Ellis was concerned. Our son-in-law was a vice president at UT Dallas, and so he arranged for us to go in January of 2003 to the Brain Health Center in Dallas, and uh, and so Gene Ellis was there for two days of observation and and training. And, uh, and, and then the doctor there, he's on the faculty at Southwest Med School, Dr. John Hart is the doctor for the Brain Health Center at that time. And so we started seeing him on a regular basis in every year and we had MRIs and we had, fortunately we had a baseline. So that was very, very helpful as we moved through this. But toward the end, I kind of borrowed from Dr. Hart, because we saw him every December for several years until things got worse. <coughs> but he would always, and he did his deal by observing her, he would ask questions and look. And, and in fact, up to 2014, he said, if she's not worse this year, I, you probably don't even need to see me next year. So the way the book ends is that uh, uh, 
we're back in Dr. Hart's office and he leans in closely and he speaks gently to me, which is not true. I, that's a little bit made up because most of his questions were to her. And he says, tell me about your favorite memory from the world of politics. And since Drew brought this up, I decided I would put this in. And then this is literally the way the book is written. I said, I wondered if that was a trick question. I wondered because I have so many great memories being elected the first time to the state Senate, serving in the honorary role as governor for a day, campaigning with Gene Ellis. I stopped there because I know, and she must have known, that she would have made a great senator if only the times in our conservative Senate district had been more welcoming to women candidates. I can't help but tell Dr. Hart about the speech Jeannie gave in 1988 for the Distinguished Women Service Awards sponsored by a group she helped to found in 1976. She urged more women to get involved in politics, saying that women would make the world a more equal and better place. Jean Ellis made the world better, I tell Dr. Hart. He nods and tells me he has one last question. He says, I will never get to interview and Ms. Sherman again. So tell me, how will you remember her? This one is easy. It is a blend of beauty, music, and intelligence. I recall for him our trip to Israel and the Mahler performance by the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra. There's not an empty seat in the house. We're part of a U.S. delegation that includes politicians at all levels of government. We're the guest of honor, seated in the first two rows just below the conductor. Jenny and I are in the two end seats on the right aisle in the second row. At the intermission, we scatter to restrooms, men out the door to the left, women to the right. The lights are dimming to start the second half of the concert and Jean Alice is not, is not back. I know that women's rooms, wherever you go to a big event are always packed. Jean Alice rushes back toward the auditorium door and when she gets there, <coughs> The door closes before she can come in. And later she tells me, and these are her words, when I arrived at the door at the right front of the auditorium, a young Israeli officer, soldier, stepped in front of me, lifted his AK-47 across his chest to block me entry. I looked him straight in the eye and confidently said, it's important that I get to my seat. He didn't know whether to shoot me or let me in. So he opened the door. Zubin Mehta, the 39-year-old conductor, was poised like Batman over Gotham with his baton raised to strike the first note of Gustav Mahler's Symphony No. 2 called Resurrection. At that very moment, he must have noticed the door hurriedly open and a woman walking. He watches, watches a suddenly 37-year-old blonde, excuse me, glide across the aisle, unabashed and unhurried, to take her seat. She sits beside me. Meta then lowers his baton. He turns and graciously to allow the elegant golden gown beauty to be seated. He then returns the baton to the poised position. And music fills the hall. I'm convinced that I saw him and Gene Alice nod to each other. There were whispers, and this is all true. There were whispers from the audience because there are about 3,000 3, Israelis in the audience. Who is that? Is she a Scandinavian princess? Could she be the wife of one of the governors? And the, the last line in the book, Jean Alice Weinbrower Sherman knew exactly who she was, always has. So now, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them because there's an awful lot of stuff and it's a long journey. 
But if not, I just have to thank you for a chance to kind of think about it, put it together and how it evolved. We have one hand up. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Storico. Hi, Max. This is Sharon Kasky Tarico. I'm Judy Kasky's daughter. T tell me again, Judy. I am I am Sharon Tarico. I am Judy Kasky's daughter. Okay, okay. And I wanted to let you know I read your book and I liked it very much. And what I liked about it is that it, to me it was very hopeful that even through the depths of the Alzheimer's, you were able to still find things to be happy about, different ways to live with Jean Alice. And you're, that's, that's so true, even up to this very moment, uh, we're having some really wonderful times. And uh, I, I think you don't, you don't wanna say that life is over, <clears throat> One of the things that I saw Judy Skaggs' uh, photo on there because I had I don't get everybody on here at once, so I have to kind of do this. But uh, I, I did a presentation for some Presbyterians here, and one of the things that uh, I've struggled with there's a section in the book about death and dying and some experiences of that because I think literally when it all hits. Uh, Many, many people think their lives are over, both for the, for the one with the Alzheimer's and the caregiver. And, uh, and there are studies that show that many, many people in that experience uh, actually take their own lives. And uh, so, I mean, it really is. It could, but it, I have learned that that's not true. And uh, I have to be careful how I tell this, but because as an essential caregiver, I'm supposed to be very careful but I really have started, I've learned that by giving some kisses to my wife, all of a sudden she just perks up and all of a sudden we're having some of the most wonderful times in the world uh, just up into last week. And so life is really, and then there, there are two examples of stigma in the book because I, I point out that, that Stigma not, is not just for those of us who are here now sitting in this, but it also exists in the memory unit. And when Jean Alice first went down there, she was very mobile and very active. She walked everywhere, did everything, took care of everyone. And one of the maintenance men here on a Sunday was down there. And, uh, and I come, I'm in my apartment and I knock on the door and he comes in. I've changed his name in the book, but his name is Phil. He said, Mr. Sherman, I just have to tell you, I was down there working and Ms. Sherman asked me to come and sit by her at the end of the hall. <clears throat> and she looked, talked to me a while and looked down the hall and there were several people sitting in wheelchairs with their heads kind of down. And she says, you know, I do not want to be like that. I don't want my family coming and seeing me like that. And she said, I, I think I'm just, I really ought to die. And uh, so, Immediately when he left, he came to tell me that story because even my beautiful wife had that same stigma of those people that their lives were over. And I tell three stories in there, but <coughs> I'll just tell one because I mentioned the little story about my little Shih Tzu dog. Well, I used to take her down to the memory unit. And so one time the organist at our University Presbyterian Church was coming to play some hymns on the piano down in the activities room. And so Scott asked Jean Alice to come down and sit by him. And so they sat there and played piano together while everybody sang the old hymns. And I had the little dog and I wasn't sure if I, what I could do with her. So I just put her in my lap. And one of the women, Mary, that I have never up until that point, never seen her show any life. She was always kind of comatose. And she's sitting beside me and I'm holding this little 11 pound black ball of, of fur in my lap and they're playing the piano. And then eerily, spookily really, it kind of shook me at first. All of a sudden I realized there was a hand patting the dog. <laughs> She, she knew the dog was there. I don't know. 
but she was very much aware. So there was something going on inside that no one had ever seen before. And that happened with one of the other ladies. She could start singing hymns. If you just played the piano, she raised that hand and she started singing. And for the group that I told stories to outside, they loved those stories about the teepee and the naked woman. They just loved it. They laughed. And so you don't want to give up. There is life going on. I think Max uh, Lee Henson Hasty, if you haven't, if you can hear me, I hear you from Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky, and I want to pick up on that um, because in Chapter Fifty Nine, you you refer to a child of Louisville, Muhammad Ali, um, who uh, is famous for saying, um, uh, uh, "Don't." Uh, uh, don't count the days, but make the days count. And I just want to say this book is a testimony uh, to that witness. Um, I also want to say and see if you would comment on this. You call Gene Alice your senior partner toward the end, your partner throughout. Uh, you call her the love of your life, your best friend. Um, I wonder if, if there are other metaphors or other words you would use to describe her because you give her voice, and it feels like that's an important, um, even when she doesn't have the voice or can put that into words, you give her voice, and that feels like that is good counsel for others who are caregivers or family members or people who are friends of those experiencing this. I mean, she says to you, don't throw in the towel, another boxing. Yeah. <laughs> you give her that voice. She didn't actually say that, but you say she, she would say that. Yeah. Uh, don't don't throw in the towel um but uh believe in resurrection believe in trust you, you give her the these words and this voice and i just wonder uh, if there are other words that you would use to describe her um or if there if if this indeed is something that helps you get through is giving her voice and thanks again for this book and thanks for this you, and thanks for joining us from louisville it's good to see you there I don't. I haven't gone through the whole list to see who we were. So, <clears throat> the, the, the Capital City Village needs to realize you've got friends all the way in Kentucky. But I do think that's extremely important. Uh, and uh, and and of course, one of the themes in the book that uh, Esther McIntosh uh, talks about, who was head of the the um, humanities councils in the country for a long time, is the partnership because. Uh, I think that it was very important, uh, and that's why the releasing the butterfly is really kind of morphed out of it, <coughs> because she really uh, she wanted to be free, and and she knew as the daughter, granddaughter of a of a minister who who, who wouldn't let his wife, his her my her mother, her grandmother loved snuff. She she snuffed and snuff all of her life, but she had to always hide it. And, uh, and Jean Alice and her brother had to sneakily buy it and get it to her because in my, my mother-in-law, who was the daughter of the preacher, uh, she loved those dirty off color jokes. And, uh, and yet she, she couldn't acknowledge that she did in the church. So, and then Jean Alice loved to dance. And that's one of the great things I think even in this Lee, thank you. But one of the things, even, even up until to last Friday, if she doesn't want to get up, I'll reach over and I'll say, now, Miss Sherman, would you dance with me? So dancing has become a, a, a metaphor for a resurrection for us because she'll get up and dance. And one of my favorite stories is after she was in memory care and I'm over in the apartment one evening, I went down, it would be the 42nd anniversary, I think of Westminster. It's outside, it's beautiful. And I'm on one side of the commons and all of a sudden the nurse brings her and Miss Curtis out over the other one. And so my next door neighbor says, well, isn't that Jean Alice? And so here she's in memory care and I'm here. And I say, it sure is. So I start walking over to her Well, she sees me. And here's this woman with Alzheimer's in memory care. And she prances, she literally prances, skips over to me and we meet and we jitterbug. We jitterbug out in front of that little commons area. And so dancing is a metaphor for, for life and resurrection and, and singing hymns is one. And, and I tell in there, and, and even now to myself from, from my own therapy, I'll be sitting at 
alone kind of meditating and I'll start singing, uh, oh Lord, what a morning, oh Lord, what a morning from the old spiritual. And the way it's originally written is when the stars begin to fall. But Gene Alice and I are in Montana one time and we go out to watch the Yellowstone River and we're singing it together. And we sing, oh, Lord, what a morning when the sun begins to rise. And, and we still do that. And, and every once in a while, I'll test her out and see if she wants to join me in doing that. Is Thank Scott, you, Scott have his hand up there to ask me a question? I'm not sure. Anyone else? I, I only have part of this. I see someone's finger up. Tom McCorse. Okay. Thank you for an incredible story of, uh, of what you had hoped it would be. That is uh, hope for the future. But I think the insights that you have uh, given us are just phenomenal, uh, particularly for somebody who's in the doctor business, just to hear the way and the importance of dealing with people as dementia comes on, of directing your conversation to the patient, to the one who has the problem. You're there as the support. But I think it's so important that that person still is the center of the discussion, so to speak. I, real quick question, and of course, you fortunately have been in a good place uh, support-wise, but do you find much support throughout the community for some of the challenges that uh, this disease has brought to your uh, relationship? Tom, um, thank you very much. And 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 and, and Kay and Tom, uh, you get Amarillo and Mar married to bet down here because it's it's a uh, it's it's really a you know it goes back I think to uh, I think in Amarillo as a young lawyer still in my twenties I ended up chairing the health facilities committee so I think uh, in many ways I I kind of was a lawyer who sp spent a lot of time with medicine. And I had probably all the senior doctors in, on that health facilities committee back there because we had to make some tough choices. So I kind of I kind of watch what I'm seeing here. And if I it's a, it deals with a little politics, I just wish that everyone would have something that Gene Alice does have, and that is we had we 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 had. Uh, an insurance policy. So Monday through Friday, she has Monique with her. And Monique has been with her over six years now. And so Monique is able to do what I was not able to do. The caregiver can't be there all the time. The caregiver sometimes just needs to, 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 to breathe. And, uh, and Monique has uh, had 18 years experience uh, when I shattered my femur, I was at St. David's Hospital and our kids had to figure out what to do. And so our daughter actually vetted four people and hired Monique and, and she's been with us. She's very much, she's more important to Jean Alice than I am. So I think from the medical side of it, Tom, if I were saying, I just wish everyone could have someone for two or three hours every day that could be with them in a special way, not to be, because most health caregivers on, on, on around even a place like Westminster, which is very fortunate. <coughs> I'm, I happen to be one of the two elected residents on the bo corporate board, you know, but Westminster is a nonprofit. So everything goes back into the facility. But even here, uh, the people that work are covering a lot of bases. And, uh, and you know, you'll have, uh, but they, I did not know that one evening I was over for an event in the evening, the lady who gives medications, uh, she realized that some of the people put the medication in their mouth and don't swallow it. And then they spit it out later. Well, that was news to me. I didn't know that, but uh, good caregivers are very, very important. And I think they have them here, but I don't think, I don't think anyone has enough. I just wish that some kind of a universal health care or something that you could have a facility that everyone and those of us that are fortunate to have means to have someone we can, but the large majority of people would not fall into that category. So I think that's the one thing that it seems to me that 
I, I see AIDS <coughs> as I've gone back and forth as an essential caregiver, taking care of about three people. And there's a very distinguished pianist there. There's another great artist who was a great writer, a painter. And there are a couple of academics that are very well known. You would know their names. And uh, and you've got one person trying to take care of three and they do a great job. They get them exercising, they get them watching things, but then they can, they can only stretch so thin. And the other thing that I think is, is a commentary on the whole system is that I think healthcare, at least as, as I've observed it here, would be in a terrible mess if it weren't for immigrant populations. Uh, uh, there's so many people of color that are taking care of people. <coughs> a lot of people from Africa, a lot of people from the islands. As I recall, <coughs> let me sip of water here and keep my voice. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, about 68% of the care of the helpers, and, and not just in healthcare, but all of Westminster, are people that have origins in other countries somewhere in their family. And if, if it's true here, in Westminster pays more, they have better benefits, so I'm sure they attract. But I think that, uh, you know, if we do not realize how important uh, that population is, and you run into cultural issues, I think even now, you have the cultural issue that if you were from an African-American family, you've learned to distrust the medical community. And so I think there are many people who've grown up and they're, you know, they, they're afraid to, to get the vaccine. And uh, you have uh, some people from that have African backgrounds that men don't do jobs that women normally do. They don't take care of the children. They you know, it's a woman's job. They don't take care of the house. Well, that puts a pressure on the woman if she's the caregiver, an employee at a place like Westminster or another facility, then trying to juggle being a mother, a parent, and doing jobs that maybe the husband could help with. So you, you run into all those issues. So it's almost a microcosm of, uh, of the world that we live in. Thank you. As we start to wrap up, would you tell us again the exact name of your book and where can we order it from? Or okay. against the world. <laughs> it's, called, it's called Releasing the Butterfly, a Love Affair in Four X. And it's out on Amazon as a paperback and as a Kindle. And uh, through a friend in our church, uh, and probably in the next couple of weeks, it's going to be available on audiobooks. Uh, it's not there yet, but it's, it's, it, this friend wanted to do it, and so he's worked with the engineers and done all the mechanics, and it's now soon to come out. But it's on all of it is on Amazon, so it can be ordered directly from there. And and uh, I'm really anxious to listen to the audio book myself. <laughs> See, uh, again, on behalf of Capital City Village and both the members and the visitors today, we need to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, if you want to know a little more about Capital City Village, I would again emphasize that you can go to capitalcityvillage.org and learn something about it. If you want to have some communication with Max, if you need to, you can always email that to Capital City Village and we'll forward it to Max. Uh, but again, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else, uh, Rick, any parting words? Drew, do you have any parting words? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I would just I would just like to say that that the book was very very enjoyable. I I thought it was very uh, very well written and uh, it didn't give you a huge amount of anxiety. It was uh, um, uh, very informational. I thought and so I would give it two thumbs up. <laughs> now well, we need uh, four thumbs. Remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>